everyone, and welcome to Cure Club, a casual review series focusing on current episodes of the long-running anime Pretty Cure. For a while now, I have wanted to keep up with the Pre-Cure series as it aired. However, I always seem to either be way too late to the party, or I forget to keep up and fall behind real fast. So I thought maybe sharing my viewing experiences with all of you lovely folks would help keep me on schedule for once. I unfortunately don't have time to make a video every week, but I can probably do one every three to four weeks-ish, so that's the tentative frequency I'll go with for now. Keep an eye on the community feed for any scheduling announcements or the like on that front. Now, if you haven't watched the last three weeks worth of Precure, I strongly suggest you watch them before watching this video. As the name Cure Club implies, I am going to treat this like a book club and assume anyone watching these videos has already watched the episodes, so spoilers everywhere. Unfortunately, since most Precure series are not available outside Japan, I cannot direct anyone to official sources for the episodes. There are a few groups fan-subbing the series, though, and I personally will be following Overtime Subs' releases of the episodes. Overtime? Subs? Subses? What's the possessive on that? I don't know. Anyway, regardless of which releases you watch, I highly recommend using torrents as opposed to using streaming sites. My philosophy is that while piracy is not great and should be avoided where feasible, if you're going to pirate media, at least try to do so safely and without giving ad revenue to shady organizations. If there's some legitimate reason you have for using streaming sites, obviously I cannot stop you, but if torrents are an option for you, I strongly urge you to consider them. And use an ad blocker at least, good god, malware protection 101 people. Okay, soapboxing is over now, no more soapboxing. So let's kick things off with my thoughts on the first three episodes of the 16th Precure series, Star Twinkle Precure, yay! I didn't get too far into last year's series, Hugto Precure, before I fell behind. However, I will say I remember the first few episodes being very well paced. There was plenty of time given to getting to know the lead, Hana, before she became a cure, and the introduction of the second and third cures was nicely spaced too, with a neat twist on the formula for Cure et toi in particular. So I was a bit concerned going into Star Twinkle at first. When we're introduced to the new pink cure, Hikaru, we barely get to know her for 30 seconds before one of the fairies for this series, Fua, pops out of a wormhole and takes her on a journey through space by way of Lisa Frank. I would have preferred to see a bit more of Hikaru in her daily life before she got involved in anything magical, since that way we would have had more grounding in which to place her reactions to the magic stuff. That said, we do get to see some more mundanity after Fua disappears, with the elements of Hikaru's life being introduced as she barrels past them in search of the fairy. In hindsight, that's a nice way to do her introduction, showing that this sort of high-energy, imaginative behavior is normal for her, as well as how each person in her life feels about that. The faster pace probably makes sense, too, considering all the stuff the series needs to set up in the first episode. Comparing to Hugto again, we can't just casually drop in moments with all the cures to be and leave them to be properly introduced later. I mean, we get that for two of them, but one of the girls this time around, Lala, is an actual alien. She can't just casually show up. By her very concept, she needs a proper introduction up front as part of the series' world building. With that in mind, giving the first half of the episode to Hikaru and Fua, and the second half to the space elements, including Lala, isn't a bad setup. It's especially not bad, considering the pacing improves in episodes 2 and 3. With all the most important setup out of the way in episode 1, we get a roomier episode 2 in which to explore Lala and her whole deal on the way to becoming Cure Milky. Which is... adorable. The scene with her and the Onigiri, it's... Oh my god! Ah! So cute! It maybe would have been nicer to save her purification for episode 3 and let the show flesh out her self-doubt and dedication to Data a bit more, but I'm also not exactly complaining about getting to see her absolutely amazing transformation sequence sooner than later, so, you know, little, little wounds, you know. Oh my god, it's so good. Ah! The same goes for episode 3's pacing. 
I am very glad that we didn't get Elena rushed into being Cure Soleil in her introduction. We aren't ready for that yet. Elena and Hikaru barely know each other, and we as an audience don't know much about Elena beyond her being, as Abareno on Twitter puts it, full mom friend. Plus, taking at least one more episode to establish Hikaru and Lala's dynamic before adding another team member is welcome. The strength of pairs in Precure goes all the way back to Futariwa, so I'm glad we're getting a good sense of the core pair dynamic over the first three episodes. Hikaru and Lala have conflicting personalities on some fronts, but ultimately they make a great team when they listen to one another. I'm looking forward to seeing how their friendship continues over the course of the series, and how Lala continues adapting to life on Earth. Regarding other characters, the fairies for this series are pretty good. Prunz, or Purins, depending on the romanization, is your standard dad fairy like Tart or Harry, and he gets some fun visual gags with the elasticity of his body. Pua, thank goodness, is not annoying at all, as Precure babies tend to be. This is thanks to a combination of an adorable character design, cheerful personality, and lack of need for things like formula, soothers, diaper changes, etc. Fua's ability to create wormholes is also interesting, as is their connection to the marketing MacGuffins for this series, the Twelve Pens of the Zodiac Princesses. We've only met one of the princesses so far, Taurus, and she's… nice. She's nice. There's not much else to say about her so far, since all we've seen her do is exposit. I do love, though, how the bull horns are incorporated into her hairstyle. That's super rad. Really, rad is a word I could apply to the entire look of this series. The main thing distinguishing Star Twinkle from its predecessors thus far is, of course, its space and sci-fi aesthetic. A nicely paced Precure series with appealing characters would be fine enough, but what really pops this year is the visuals. Not in terms of animation quality. That's fine too, although admittedly the Sakuga isn't quite as noteworthy as I found it in Hugto so far. But in terms of design work and art direction, I am in love with this anime. Ray gun sci-fi and retrofuturism are styles I adore, so of course this series was likely to be my jam from the start. Of course, the standard frills and fluff of regular Precure designs are still here in full force. The way those high femme elements mix with the sci-fi elements, though, is just a treat for my rainbow-loving eyes. There is so much color! This entire show is a bowl of rocket ship-shaped marshmallows on a Saturday morning. I just can't get enough of it. And I will spend the whole rest of this video gushing about it if I don't stop myself here. I do wonder if the reason we haven't seen a space-themed Precure before, though, is due to showrunners wanting to avoid Sailor Moon ripoff accusations. Precure already gets enough of those without also linking the girls to celestial bodies, so maybe that's understandable. I think this execution is a brilliant way to get around that restriction, though. Both Star Twinkle Precure and Sailor Moon are magical girl series with astronomical motifs. <clears throat> and the ditzy protagonist with twin tails and confusing hair spheres. However, the space stuff in Sailor Moon feels more fairy tale esque, mythical even, making the space aspect feel almost incidental. The Moon Kingdom could easily just be some fantasy realm in a nearby dimension, just like the Magic Kingdom in Sally the Witch. Contrast that with Star Twinkle, which commits hardcore to the concept of space! The main character loves space, her dad loved space, and I'm sure we'll get more into his conspicuous absence as the series goes on. Stars and constellations appear everywhere, including in names like Hoshina and Hoshizorakai. One of the cures is an alien, with antennae and a retro-futuristic outfit. The fairies are aliens, the bad guys are aliens. At least one major battle has taken place in orbit over Earth, the girls hang around Lala's rocket ship all the time, and there have been several sci-fi references so far, including Help us, Fua One Kenobi! You're our only hope! Kapard's double-bladed lightsaber, Kapard's name possibly being a mix of Kappa and Picard, Hikaru name-dropping Adamski UFOs, and the henchmen for this series looking like stereotypical silver jumpsuited space people. And speaking of those space people, if the show's aesthetic and theming are its most noticeable features, the next most noticeable so far would be its lack of Monsters of the Week. 
This could easily change in future episodes, but for now, the lack of a Zakenna or Uzaina or whatever type of monster is really refreshing to see. I like the focus on the Knot Rays as the main grunts, since not only do they do some fun formation work, they can also act individually, which is interesting. I love the Knot Ray who acts all blushy blushy after delivering the Taurus pen to Tenjo. And I also really like that the animation team took the effort to show the Knot Rays don't all have the same body type. I kind of wonder if we'll be seeing more from any individual Knot Rays later in the series, or if this'll just be a fun way to give the Faceless Grunts some more personality throughout the run. As for the Generals, they're alright so far. Capard is the most enjoyable to watch, and given that we've already seen him in a somewhat vulnerable moment at the Waterfall, he shows the most potential for an eventual redemption arc. Tenjo seems like a generic, busty lady so far, but we've only seen her in one episode, so there's still plenty of time for her to gain more depth, maybe. It might have been neat to see her with an actual Tengu nose, but I also like the way her mask evokes the nose, so... Eh. By the by, the use of traditional Japanese monsters on the villain team is interesting, since it's the only non-space-themed motif in the show. I dig it. Next, I'd like to talk about the transformations. I already said Cure Milky's transformation is tops, and Cure Stars isn't too shabby either. The aspect I'm sure people will want to hear about, though, is the singing. This is the first time we've had singing in the regular transformation sequences. The fact that Hikaru's Seiyu is an idol outside the anime is telling of how much Toei wants to sell this aspect of the series. So, does it work? Mm, kinda. I mean, it's not bad or annoying or anything so far, but the melody and lyrics feel undercooked, let's say. Like, it's competent, it's it's even a bit catchy, in the sense that twinkle doo, twinkle doo, pretty cute, ah, is so on the nose that it will defo stick in your head. The best part is probably the instrumentation, which you can hear best as the pens wave at the start, but eh, yeah, it's not super impressive. It remains to be seen if this becomes more annoying over time or not. On that note, ah, the music for the opening and ending themes is a lot better. The light electronic elements in both songs are fitting considering the show's theming, and both are decent enough bubblegum bops. If I had to pick favorites, I'd say I like the ending a bit better, if only because of and Also, I'll say it, I really like the CG dancing this year. CG has always been a bit iffy with Precure, but I think they've found a really appealing style with the thick outlines and lightly shadowed cell shading. The models move smoothly, the joints aren't too stiff, and they feel expressive enough for what they need to do. So good on the CG team this year. Kudos. Anyway, based on the first three episodes, I'd say Star Twinkle Precure is looking promising so far. Thumbs up. It's not exactly a revolutionary show, sure. Still, it knows what it's trying to be, and I'm down for what it has to offer. Really looking forward to episode 4, and to the next installment of Cure Club in a few weeks. Next time, I'd like to highlight some of your opinions in proper book club fashion. So let me know in the comments what you thought of these episodes. Do you like what you've seen so far? Anything you dislike or want to see improved? Any hopes for future episodes? Predictions for what we'll see from Elena and Madoka coming up? Thoughts on that mysterious glasses girl in the opening who definitely totally for sure isn't the fifth cure, wink wink, nudge nudge? I'm looking forward to your responses, and we'll see you all then! Thanks so much again to all my patrons who support me every month, especially Anna, Author X, Julia and Kyle, Lavitz, Otaku no Podcast, Rally Vincent, who deserved better, and by special request, here is my very best Akko transformation phrase. <clears throat> I wouldn't be doing this if not for the generous support of viewers like you. You can support me on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash Aaron Cerise. You can make small one-time donations at ko-fi.com slash Aaron Cerise. Or you can always share this video and leave a like or comment to show your support. Thanks so much again, and have a good day! Goodbye!